Welcome to a special edition of the Schmoville After Show. I'm your host, Brian Davids. As many of you have heard by now, we got some bad news recently as Collider Nightmares is on the bubble. So Clark Wolf reached out to me to talk about the status of the show and what we can do to help keep the show on the air. We also talked at great length about what the show's subject matter truly is. I've noticed some comments from people who thought that Nightmares was nothing but horror talk when it's actually more genre oriented. So before we get to Clark's interview, here are the ways that you can help. Number one, share every new episode for the rest of the month via social media. Number two, tell a friend. Number three, tweet hashtag save nightmares to Christian and Campia like there's no tomorrow, especially Christian. And make sure to watch the show on YouTube. I know some of you like to listen to the show as a podcast, but if you want to keep listening to the show, it's critical that you watch or listen by way of YouTube. One last thing, besides the Save Nightmares campaign, Clark and I talked a little schmodown. However, we talked on February 2nd, which was right before her recent schmodown team match. Anyway, enough of this intro, let's get to Clark. Clark Wolf, welcome to the Schmoville After Show. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. While I wish I was welcoming you under better circumstances, hopefully this appearance will do its part to improve current circumstances. So in case the audience hasn't heard already, news dropped this week that Collider Nightmares is on the bubble unless ratings improve. So Clark, what can you say about the rating situation currently? First of all, I just want uh, everybody to know that we're not officially done yet. So anybody who's interested in checking out the show, we've still got a bunch of episodes to go. So that's the really good news. And, um, you know, I think what we've found is that our base is very strong. We're, we're really consistent with that, you know, percentage of the Collider video audience that we hold down every week, which was, which is awesome. I think because, Maybe people aren't as familiar with the show. They maybe not aren't giving it a try uh, like they would another show that would be on Collider Video. And so we're just not hitting the numbers that they would like to see or showing the growth that they would like to see in order to keep us around. And keep in mind, Nightmares has been on the air since the first week of June 2016. So we've been around for a little while, um, but we haven't quite hit that year mark. You know, I want to say in addition to just numbers, I'm really, really proud of a lot of the stuff that we've started to be able to do. Um, For instance, you know, Fox reached out to us about their television show, The Exorcist. And we had Gina Davis on our show, uh, you know, in a one-on-one interview, which was super exciting. And we've had Doug Jones and we've had, you know, partnered with STX and we're partnering with A24 to premiere the screening, the LA screening of XX, the new um, anthology series that is, um, that premiered at Sundance. So we have so much that has already happened and other big brands and studios and people are interested in us as well. So we really are starting to gain our footing. But yeah, we they would just like to see our numbers be a little bit stronger and a little bit more consistent. And, you know, unfortunately, because we're dealing in video and views, I'm so happy to hear that people listen to us while they drive to work and they download the podcast or they stream a podcast version. But unfortunately, those numbers don't really count towards the goals that we're trying to achieve. So so really what we're looking for are those views on the YouTube channel. Do you have an idea of the numbers that you need to stay on air or is corporate looking for more of an upward trend over time? Yeah, that's a really good question. If we consistently hit 40 or 45 over the next month, I think that would be really promising. And I think that that would give the people who make these kinds of decisions a good indication that people are interested in the show. They, they just maybe hadn't found it before uh, or, or whatever the circumstance is. And, and I also want to be really, really clear for the listeners and for, for anyone who happens upon this. All of the higher ups, John, Christian, um, Dennis, like all, all of these people have been super supportive. And the fact that we're even putting this out there is a really good thing because they did not 
spring it on us and say, you know, oh, you're done. Like, that's it. They, they're they giving us time and letting us know, like, hey, guys, we just need to see a str- these numbers strengthen. Otherwise, we can't justify this continuing, which I think is perfectly a perfectly reasonable request. So I just want the audience to know that that they've been really great and and you know they're they're just doing their jobs but they've been very communicative and supportive and open to trying new things which has been really really cool. I was just going to make the same point. In no way is this conversation meant to vilify corporate. After all, they're the ones that greenlit the show last summer. They put up the money to produce the show. So they have every right to have performance expectations. But like you said, there is a silver lining. You get the chance to save your own show. And not every show has been able to say that. So that's a testament to the fan base that you do have. Right. What's upsetting to me right now, though, is that there is still a misconception amongst some of the Collider subscribers that think Nightmares is nothing but horror talk or that you need to love horror to watch the show. And while Nightmares covers plenty of mainstream and indie horror topics, I'd say that you're just as much a genre show. So can you tell people what Nightmares is in case they're judging the show at face value? Absolutely. So, you know, before before the show was announced, it was it was announced by people that were not me and they were teasing it as Collider's horror talk show. And um, that's not wrong because certainly like you said and like our audience knows we are very uh we're we're very horror centric i'd say that is a good percentage of what it is that we cover however you know i think when you dig a little deeper and you talk to people who are genre fans and i just said it there i can't even say like horror fans <laughs> i use the term genre um very liberally and i do that on purpose because i think that most people who are working in the atmosphere of horror science fiction fantasy um thrillers things like that they they use the term genre because it's more it's more inclusive. And I think that it's actually more accurate because the thing that I've found is when you say horror to a person, even a person who loves movies, they nine times out of 10 automatically think Jason, Freddy, Leatherface, they think slasher movies. And while slasher movies are absolutely a huge part of the genre and the, um, the pop culture importance of the genre, there's so much more to it, you know, from the universal monsters to Hannibal Lecter to, you know, um, invasion of the body snatchers to, it's, I could go on and on and on. So we love genre. And also the reason, and I've said this on the show before, but I do think it's important because I, I want the audience to know that it actually is thought out. The reason that we call the show Collider Nightmares and not Collider Horror Talk is because we want to explore the things that give you nightmares. So if that's a scene in Shaun of the Dead, if that's a scene from the original Planet of the Apes, if that is, you know, and anything in between, if that's a scene of the uh, White Walkers in Game of Thrones, which I think is, for my money, some of the White Walker sequences are the best zombies that I've seen on screen in years, but that just kind of goes to show, like, well, that's a fantasy show or that's a drama show. So we do call it nightmares for a specific reason. Um, it, it casts a wide net and it really allows us to not have to deal with this question of, well, is it this or is it that? It's like, no, it, it's something that is meant to scare you or unsettle you. And that's what we're going after. I like the show because it serves as a palate cleanser for all the superhero and lightsaber based content and discussion on the channel. And I love those things. Don't get me wrong, but sometimes I want to hear about the latest with M night Shyamalan or universal's monster reboots, as well as stranger things or Jurassic world. And to be honest, I'm not even a huge horror fan. Traditionally speaking, I'm more of a horror thriller or thriller horror guy, such as it follows the conjuring, even the guest. But I still watch Nightmares every week because it gives added time to the topics that Movie Talk may not have time for. So as far as promotion, is there anything you'd like to see done differently to promote the show and create awareness in these next uh, set of shows? 
First of all, I have to say a big thank you. For, thank you to you, first of all, for saying that you watch the show. I really appreciate that. And I, and I love, honestly, I love hearing from fans who say, or people who watch and they say, you know, I'm not even a horror fan, but I just love this show. Or you guys have gotten me excited about the genre before. Or, hey, maybe I'll give this a try. What are some things that I should start with? You know, that to me is the biggest compliment because some of those titles that you just mentioned from the Universal Monsters, to The Conjuring, to Stranger Things, to The Walking Dead, and American Horror Story. These are major franchises that are making hundreds of millions of dollars, which is so cool. Because uh, I think a lot of people secretly like this stuff. It's just maybe they don't know they like it. So I love hearing that, that you watch the show, and I appreciate that. And in terms of promotion in the future, I have to extend another big thank you to the audience who saw us on social media. Um, you you know, Schnepp tweeted out that, you know, we were on the bubble and he's absolutely right. And, um, and I followed suit and we've been trying to galvanize our base and let them know, look guys, tell your friends, or if you've caught it a few times and you've been meaning to watch it, but you know, you forget or you get busy or whatever, which I totally understand, just remember or realize that if you guys never get around to us, then those numbers don't go up and then we can't stick around and then you'll never be able to get around to us. So in the future, what we'd like to see in terms of promotion is just if you watch the show, give us an upvote or or leave a comment, you know, because they think that sort of drives YouTube traffic or if you want to share on your Facebook page, you know, straight from YouTube and that way that way people can uh, can just click it right there on Facebook, you know, or Twitter. That's a great, that's a great option as well. But, um, you know, we're certainly doing as much as we can to promote it on our end. And we're really, really grateful for the support that's come out over the last day, um, really for, for what it is that we're doing. John Schnepp dropped a plug on the Schmoes No Show last night as well. So I was glad to see that you guys started on Tuesday and then moved to Wednesday morning. I follow your numbers closely every week because I do this show, but I feel like the change to Wednesday morning around Thanksgiving time has, in fact, led to an uptick in ratings. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on the release day and time? We're all on the same team over at the channel. And so if it would work out better for heroes to have heroes go up on Tuesday um, or and us go up on Wednesday, that was a decision that or you know we were happy to accommodate. And yeah, and I think that the idea of putting us up maybe at 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time on Wednesdays, hopefully Hopefully it's in your inbox. Maybe we catch you right before your lunch break, or maybe we catch you right before you get in the car, or your public transportation to get to work uh, or school, and um, and you can listen to us on the way. So that that's I think a positive thing and something that we're going to try next week and tentatively maybe for the rest of our run, um, we're going to try and go live actually uh, on our next episode. And so I want the audience to know because we've been sounding the alarm that we might get canceled when nightmares doesn't show up in your inbox on Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Don't give up on us. We haven't quit. We're gonna we're gonna do the show live. And hopefully maybe that way while people are at their office or at their school or whatever they're doing, if they see hey Collider Video is live, they might tune in and go, okay, I'll I'll give this a try and maybe they'll like it. You guys have had some tremendous guests on the show. You mentioned Gina Davis. You just had Paul W.S. Anderson on the show, who did an entire episode, which was great to see. Mm -hmm. Talk about your guests as well as your favorite guest experience so people can learn what they might be missing. Absolutely. Well, you know, we have a pretty regular panel, but I do like to switch it up every now and again. And of course, our panelists are all running around like crazy people, very busy. And so sometimes they're out of town and we have to have somebody sit in for them. So we've had Mark Ellis on our show, which I love. We've had Cobster on our show. We've had uh, Rebecca McKendry, who is the editor in chief of Blumhouse.com and actually has her doctorate in film with a focus in horror, which I love. Uh, and 
so she's actually a horror doctor, <laughs> um, which is awesome. And uh, we've also had Terry Metalis, who is the showrunner and co-creator of 12 Monkeys on Sci-Fi, is another great example of a very genre-bending show that absolutely has horrific elements. It very much lives in the sci-fi world. Um, it's very much a drama. I think it absolutely fits into Nightmares, and I think it's one of the best and most underappreciated shows on television. So it was really fun for us. And Terry, by the way, is just a huge nerd like the rest of us. So it was, if you'll notice, like we all talked a lot. That was a longer episode. But I think it was good because, you know, we were all we were all having such a good time and we all had so many things to contribute. So, yeah. And Paul, having Paul W.S. Anderson was awesome. He was a lot of fun and certainly could give a real um, industry perspective to our fandom, you know, which was awesome. So in addition to Paul and Gina and Terry, we've had Steve Zaragoza. Um, we've had a whole handful of really fun people. Ben Bagley, who a lot of people know from Josh McCuga's, uh, Josh McCuga used to co-host Guilty Movie Pleasures with him. Um, he comes on the Schmoes show a lot. So Ben Bagley is a huge horror fan. He wrote and starred in a horror movie and he and I actually co-starred in a horror short together so that was you know it's it's all a big family fun community and and I'm so lucky to have um, the guests that we've had and I look forward to having more guests you know there are people who are expressing interest in our show that we'd love to have on uh, but we got to have more shows to have them on <laughs> are you unwilling to pick a favorite or is this just a matter of diplomacy which I understand why don't I pick myself for the episode that I couldn't talk and I was just sitting on the sidelines? I'll take that answer, definitely. No, I mean, really and truly, like, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, and I don't mean it from an um, arrogant or egotistical way. I don't believe we've ever had a bad show. I'm incredibly proud of our panelists, of, of their knowledge, of our passion for what it is that we're talking about, and our guests. So I'm, uh, and you know, I have to be honest, too, um, I've had conversations with the programming team at Collider, and um, they they have very few notes for us. And and I'm, again, that's not meant to be braggadocious. That's meant to say, like, they're proud of the show and we're proud of the show. Um, so we just want to get it out in front of as many eyeballs as we can. But I say all of that to say, if, you know, there have been a handful of people who have chimed in and said, like, yeah, I started watching, but it lost me. You know, I don't like it anymore. And, and I want to hear, okay, specifically, what would you like to see? Or what are you not seeing that you'd like to see? Because comments of the show sucks now isn't helpful to me. Like, believe it or not, I want people to like the show that we put out. So so I need I need specifics. And some people have weighed in and, and given great feedback. Constructive criticism and notes are always welcome. And I, I sincerely mean that. We have so much genre material coming, whether it's Alien Covenant, Kong Skull Island, War for the Planet of the Apes, The Mummy. Once movies are promoted, even prior to release and then upon their release, the interest in nightmares would likely increase. So it's frustrating, at least for me, and I'm sure it is for you, that we're kind of in the doldrums of January and February, and we've still got a few weeks to go until Get Out comes out, mm -hmm. as well as Kong on March 10th. So you've been around this industry for a while, and you know that certain movies can drive an audience single-handedly. So mm -hmm. is it frustrating that you don't have that big tentpole release that would help a great deal right now when you need it most? Something that we've talked about behind the scenes is if, you know, the new feature film adaptation of It dropped a trailer tomorrow, I have a feeling that our numbers would go up. You know what I mean? It's, um, Absolutely. That, and that, that is kind of frustrating because unfortunately... As I said, we've had that that really strong core base who I'm so proud that we have and I love that and they're very loyal and they dig the show and I love that. For some reason, you know, we're not getting the 100,000 people who watch Jedi Council every week because they always want to know about Star Wars or the regular amounts of people who watch movie talk every day. And granted, I, I want to be very clear. I understand that our show is is much more of a niche show. Um, and that's not, you know, a secret to me. But I do think that yeah, it is. It is a little frustrating when, you know, we don't have our Rogue One right now. We don't have, you know, our Batman news right now. Yeah, it can be a little frustrating, but there's a lot of other cool stuff out there, too, that I'm 
I'm really happy that we've had the opportunity to cover. So, you know, it's, it is interesting though, but yeah, you're right. It it's, it's tough sometimes. Conversely, when $9 million films like Split or Don't Breathe clear $100 million with ease, I just hope that Campia and Fernandez and Harloff recognize that the audience for Nightmares is definitely out there, which they probably do, and the show can benefit from those $9 million films that pop out of nowhere, as well as the genre tentpole. So it'd be a shame to cut the show short before Kong, Alien, Apes, the Mummy, since there haven't been any substantial genre temple since June 2016 when the show started. And these are the films that you've been working up to this entire time, a la Jedi Council and Rogue One, or Heroes, and the half a dozen superhero films they get to cover. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And listen, you know, as the year continues, like, I, there is something I kind of want to address. Um, there have been a handful of people who have, like, gotten on me about about our coverage of The Bye Bye Man, which for the, I want to say a couple of things. The first thing I want to say is that the director of The Bye Bye Man, Stacey Title, is an Academy Award nominee. So you guys should pay attention to her. Like all fans should pay attention to her. If you love movies, she's a freaking Oscar nominee. Second of all, Doug Jones is a creature god and I love him. And any chance to talk to him and talk about him is great. Finally, The Bye Bye Man is a fun movie. It's not for everybody and that's fine. But to your point about box office success, The Bye Bye Man outperformed, I want to say, if I'm not mistaken, Patriot's Day. And it also definitely performed Ben, outperformed Ben Affleck's new movie. So my point is there is an audience for this. It, and it, whether it's M. Night Shyamalan, whether it's a teenage, uh, you know, creature feature like The Bye Bye Man, whether it's an R-rated, very um, socially relevant movie like Jordan Peele's movie, which I guarantee you is going to be a financial success when it comes out in a few weeks. And then, of course, you get into the Kongs and you get into the mummy and you get into uh, the list goes on and on. I agree wholeheartedly. The numbers are there. The audience is there. The dollars are there. And, you know, genre fans are are a broad base. They're they're teenagers. They're older people. They're every background and ethnicity and all genders, you know. So I do think that, that the audience is there. I do wish that we were able to market specifically targeted marketing like Facebook ads or, or something like that. But unfortunately that's just not an option for us right now. And so we are relying on people like you to have me on your show uh, and the audience to spread the word on their social media accounts and, and so forth. So yeah, the, you, I know the numbers are there. We just, we just got to get it in front of their eyes. Like you said, shifting gears for a second. You recently bypassed your Wolves of Steel teammate, Mark Riley, and your Collider Nightmares co-host, to play JTE in a movie trivia schmodown singles match. <laughs> You've also got a team match coming up with Mark Riley as Wolves of Steel against Six Degrees. Now, I'm sure Christian was thinking many moves ahead on this, but was this decision based partially on the need to cross-promote Nightmares with the host of Nightmares via a big Schmodown match. <laughs> that is giving Christian a lot of credit, which he absolutely deserves. And knowing him and his wonderful producer mind, that may have been somewhere in there. Uh, but no, uh, as, far as, as far as I know, uh, no. My decision to... Challenge JTE was, I think, more because, look, I, when it comes to the Schmodown, I've talked about the fact that it gives me major anxiety, and um, it makes me very nervous, of course, the team matches and the singles matches, but, you know, when I lost my second match to Josh Makuga um, a couple of months ago, I am not going to lie, that made me angry, and it also frustrated me, and it made me kind of, and it rattled me. It made me take a step back because I realized that sometimes the game just takes you in a place that you have no control over. And so the reason for talking and challenging JTE is because he's on a hot streak right now. 
Um, and, uh, and I could use a little fire under my ass as well. And so for him and I to go head to head will be fun. And look, if he, uh, if he wins, then man, he's, I mean, and it's not about me. It's just like singles matches are hard. And if he wins three in a row or however many it's been, that's, that's a huge accomplishment. So that's great for him. And he's well on his way to the title shot. And then, but if I win, you know, that's an added mojo that I certainly have been lacking. And I'll be honest, if I don't win, I might take a step back from singles, you know, for, for an extended period of time and, and more focus on uh, team matches, I think. First off, it'd be a shame not to have you in singles play for a while, but I'm still upset about the Gamora question. I did not like multiple answer questions, and I even like to pretend that I influenced the decision to do away with them, but just know that you weren't the only one who couldn't remember that particular name, despite following the superhero stuff rather closely. I appreciate that, and uh, I think you and, uh, and, and I both... Uh, had something to do with, well, not that I made a stink about it, but I think the, I think the audience could see, and I think the judges could see that maybe that wasn't the most fair situation. So, so yeah, I'm glad they're done for, for a while at least. Clark, I want everything to work out for nightmares and I think it will, but I have to ask this question because other people have been asking it. You've been in this business for a while. You've worked with other sites, companies, channels. Clearly you have no shortage of opportunities. In the unfortunate event that Nightmares is no more, would you likely try to do a similar show somewhere else, or are you not thinking that far ahead yet? I'm not thinking that far ahead yet. I think that right now, I think we need to, you know, do our best to preserve Nightmares in its current form. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I think as we've talked about over the last couple of minutes, horror and sci-fi and fantasy and thrillers and genre is is a growing uh it's a they're growing in popularity i mean the walking dead is the biggest show on tv for goodness sake like there's definitely an audience somewhere and so so who knows what would happen if nightmares were to be canceled um but uh But, you know, horror is still my passion. It will always be my passion. Um, You guys know I love movies and I love pop culture and I love entertainment. But I have a sweet spot for all the scary things. And so I hope that if if Nightmares does not continue, there will be a place for me to nerd out about scary things on a regular basis. But I hope to not have to cross that bridge. But if I do, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Clark, aside from some guest panelists, you and Perry are really the most active female panelists at Collider. You both have your own shows. You both pop up on a number of different shows. However, you had the added responsibility of being the only woman who actively competed in Schmodown singles play this past year. Now, more women will be competing in 2017, but does nightmare status potentially affect your Schmodown involvement? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, no is the answer. No, I certainly, you know, as I said earlier in our conversation, there is no bad blood on my end if the show does not continue because all all of the higher ups at Collider have have really been supportive, and they we are all putting our heads together for ways to uh, to save the show. So I think that's great. The only thing that would affect my participation in the schmodown is if my anxiety just gets to be too much, <laughs> and I have and I and I just snap and I say I can't do it anymore, Christian. I can't do it anymore. So you know, regardless of what happens with nightmares, that that certainly would not contribute to the end of my of my schmodown career, but I other factors may, but but not. That. Well, that's a relief. I mean, as you can tell from my paranoid and cynical questions, a lot <laughs> of us are concerned about the future. So I'm glad that you have a healthier mindset about all this. Yeah. Going into the last season of the Schmodown, did you know that you were going to be the face of the female competition, especially in singles play? And while I'm sure it was a burden for you at times, I mean, you mentioned the anxiety that it gives you. Are you proud to see that your involvement has inspired other women to step forth and take the plunge? Yes to the second part. I mean, anything that encourages more lady nerds to speak up and speak out and and get in the ring, uh, I think is a good thing for sure. And whether I was aware, um, no, I don't think that that was ever the, the idea. And honestly, I don't think that 
look, I wanted to compete in the game for a while um, and knew that that I I would be able to probably hold my own, but I didn't know that I would win, if that makes sense. I wanted to win. Of course I wanted to win, but um, but I didn't know that I would. And so I don't think that I entered the league with the assumption that I would be uh, carrying the lady banner. I think it just sort of maybe happened that way. But I got to say, I mean, it's an evolving league and it's growing and it's changing. And, and it's, you know, we say it all the time, but it is so true. Getting in there and doing the schmodown is very hard. It's easy when you, and I'm not, I'm not saying this in a dismissive way, but it's so much easier when you have the comfort of your couch and your laptop to rattle off all five of the guardians of the galaxy. You know what I mean? Exactly. So, um, it's intimidating. It's intimidating for anyone. So, and also if I'm being completely honest, I think that the female competitors certainly have more to prove. Um, I hate that it's that way, but I think it's true. Um, I don't think that we should have more to prove, but unfortunately, I think the uh, in the eyes of our audience, we do have more to prove. Yeah. And um, most of the time, when when lady panelists uh, get out there and they talk, and it's more about I know the subject and I'm talking about it because I love it and because I'm educated, um, we are met with a pretty heavy scrutiny of um, our knowledge and if we're smart enough and if we actually know enough and if we're a fake nerd or you know I mean you've seen it in the comments about the about nightmares Clark is a fake horror yeah. fan which I'm like I don't even I can't even begin. it's it it doesn't bother me because I mean clearly it's just insane so but you know when you get out there and you get under the lights and you have a bad match which if you watch my title match with Dan like that's an that's a match that I'm embarrassed about that match did not go my way i hate that it didn't go that way but that's the luck of the game and so for these especially female competitors but new competitors across the board we have a lot to lose but i'm so glad that more girls are joining the league and um and i think they should and it's it can be a lot of fun when it is not the worst thing ever <laughs> <laughs> well on behalf of schmodown fans i just want to say thank you i mean i know it caused you a lot of anxiety but because you led by example other women that i've talked to who are about to play in the league have admitted that they were awfully intimidated to play but after seeing the success that you had they were far more willing to try it out well thank you for saying that and um and and i mean this very sincerely there is nothing that makes me happier than to hear things like that so that's very cool let's talk about movie talk i said last week on this show that i thought you were the top performer on last thursday's episode of movie talk you raised some great points that others overlooked especially when it came to The Flash as it's undergoing a page one rewrite. So regardless of Nightmare's fate, is movie talk something you'd like to do more of? Yeah, definitely. I mean, look, I, I think I've always said and I will continue to say if if anybody calls me, if they call me to come on the show, I, I unless I'm out of town, I'll say yes. And I've been really happy that I've been able to be on for the past two weeks in a row and I'm going to be on again tomorrow. Uh, I don't know when this will go up, but I, it'll be three weeks in a row. I love horror and sci-fi and fantasy. I love genre. However, I love movies in general. And that is the thing that brought me to AMC Movie Talk when it was AMC Movie Talk, you know, so yeah. um, way back when, when we were all living in the closet. <laughs> so, so yeah, I love, I love being on that show. And um, you probably will never see me on, on Star Wars or on Jedi Council because I unfortunately am just such a novice when it comes to that. It's Christian thinks it's that I don't really like it, which is wrong. It's just, there's so much information, but he's given me a few books to read, which I'm actually very excited to, to check out. Um, but yeah, any, any of the shows, I love coming on the Schmoes No Show. I love being on Movie Talk. Um, and I, I need to get on TV Talk. I need to call Josh McCougar and tell him to let me go on TV Talk. I think that is an excellent idea. If we can get you on TV Talk and Schmoes No at least once a month, I'll be in a much better mood when I go to record this show. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to start harassing Makuga as well as Christian, Christian, and Mark. Okay, deal. So I've asked plenty of paranoid and cynical questions. Let's get to some fun, <laughs> random questions. Firstly, who would your dream guest on Nightmares be? Oh, wow. It's kind of like a tie. It would be Guillermo del Toro. 
Yeah. Actually, he'd be first. He'd be number one because Guillermo is a fan. Guillermo's a fanboy, you know what I mean? So he he has things to say and he and he knows about these things. He's almost like a softer John Schnepp in a way. Great comparison. He's just as like he's just as salty and sassy as John Schnepp. He just says it in a very like in a very I don't know, in a way that's covered with ice cream. I don't know how else right. to explain it. But uh, I'd love to have Guillermo. I'd love to have James Wan. Um I am just a such a big fan of James. Uh, I, I think he is um, one of the greatest directors working now, forget genre. I think he's a masterful storyteller and I think he's got a great, long, eclectic career ahead of him. So I'd love to have him on. And I'd love to have uh, Jennifer Kent, who wrote and directed The Babadook on our show, um, mostly because you know, that was her first feature, um, or the first feature that kind of gave her a claim. And I interviewed her on the phone one time and she was just awesome. She's so matter of fact, she's smart, she's charming, and she loves film. You know, um, she studied under Lars von Trier. So clearly there's a lot of darkness and cool stuff there, whether it's, you know, manifesting in a horror movie or not. And so I'm a huge admirer of, uh, of Jennifer Kent. And I, I would love to talk to her in person one day. What genre of film or films are you most looking forward to in 2017? Oh my gosh. You know, get out for sure. Um, I think Jordan Peele is, you know, it's funny. I, when I nerd out about these things, I often talk about um, horror and comedy being two sides of the same coin. And I do believe that when you look at the structure of a scare versus the structure of a joke, they are, or a gag, they are very similar. Um, and uh, and so I think that, and often, and you know, any, any comedian will tell you there's a lot of darkness that comes along with that as well. Uh, but Jordan is such a huge fan of movies and entertainment and he loves horror. I admire him so much from afar and he is sort of with something like Get Out, I think he is doing what horror does best, uh, which is examine the things that make us really uncomfortable about the world that we live in. And the word on the street is that Get Out is fabulous. I have friends at Blumhouse who have told me, you know, through the whole process, what a all-star Jordan is, how impressed they are with the script, how impressed they are with the way the movie came out. And um, so I am just, as a more academic horror fan, I'm so excited about that. Um, and honestly, I think African-American people uh, in general are underrepresented in genre and um, well, they're underrepresented across the board, but I love that he is doing this. I think it's so awesome and I couldn't be more excited. And then I'm endlessly excited for The Mummy. Like, I really want to see The Mummy. Um, you know, I've talked about it on Nightmares before, but the little work I have done with Alex Kurtzman uh, when I was working on the show Sleepy Hollow and doing their official podcast, you know, he's a huge fan for this. He loves the monsters. He respects the monsters. He understands the monsters. And Chris Morgan fun fact, when I first moved to LA, I was an intern at a management company and Chris Morgan was one of our clients. And uh, I think he had just come off of Wanted. Chris Morgan was the nicest man in the whole world. I was just a dumb, dinky, awkward intern. And every day when I would walk in, he'd be like, Hi, Clark. How are you? How was your weekend? What's going on? Tell me what's up. And I've never forgotten that. So I'm so happy that he's like, you know, this major franchise guy now because he he couldn't have been nicer. Um, and then there's always independent stuff that sort of pops out of nowhere. Colossal from Nacho Vigalondo, which I saw at um, Fantastic Fest last year, comes out this spring. That's with Anne Hathaway and Jason Sudeikis. That's not horror in the traditional sense, but it's again, this like genre blendy thing. Um, and there's so many other things. Oh, devil's candy with Ethan Embry is coming out this spring. That is like a metal satanic family father daughter story, which is so awesome and weird. Um, so that one's great. I saw that at Fantastic Fest a few years ago. So there's so much. And I will say I'm morbidly curious about it because if I'm being honest, I don't think it's going to be good. Uh-oh, I think my paranoia and cynicism rubbed off on you. <laughs> Please forgive me. Yeah, I have my doubts. Not 
for any of the talent involved because I love the director. I'm unapologetically a fan of Mama. I like Mama a lot. And I thought he worked with kids great. And so I know that the cast that they've assembled is going to be great. But I'm slightly bummed because I want Carrie Fukunaga's uh, It and the fact that it was teased in front of me. So heartbreaking. It's so heartbreaking. And I could do a whole other podcast with you about why that needs to happen. Trust me, I'm lobbying John Schnepp to do a what happened for Carrie Fukunaga's It. But I just finished reading the novel, um, which was outstanding. And I'm so glad that I read it. Uh, There's no way they're making this into a mainstream movie. Let's get serious. (laughs) There is no effing way. You are not. uh, Yeah, I could go on and on. And to be honest, I am skeptical about about Bill Skarsgård as Pennywise. But I hope I am wrong. I hope I am wrong times 1,000. And I hope it is great. Uh, But my expectations are very low, which means that maybe they could be exceeded. Um, But I just, I'm very skeptical about this one. In case the audience isn't aware, you weren't a big fan of David Robert Mitchell's It Follows, but he is releasing his follow-up this year under the Silver Lake with Andrew Garfield and Riley Keough. Are you at least curious? Yes, sure. Of course I'm curious. And I I look forward to seeing it. And I don't know if I'm excited about it, but I'm definitely curious. I mean, God, what a debut with with It Follows in terms of the critical reception and the way people reacted to it. So I think, uh, you know, hopefully... He learned uh, a lot and applied that to the second. You know, I t- when I talked to um, David Sandberg, who did Lights Out, mm-hmm. I talked to him when Lights Out had wrapped and he had already started shooting Annabelle 2. And uh, I asked him, you know, like, how do you feel as first movie, second movie? And he's like, oh, my God, it's it's just worlds of difference. He was so much more confident and, and, you know, impact, excited, um, about his second film. And so I hope they've learned a lot and, and they only get better. So, so I, I definitely will check it out for sure. So whether it's David Robert Mitchell or Robert Eggers or David Sandberg or Fede Alvarez or Jennifer Kent, the list goes on. There are so many fresh talents behind the camera right now in genre filmmaking. And this is why we need Collider Nightmares to (laughs) keep track of it all. Yeah, you know, I mean, because like like some of these comments that I've seen have said, and, and I do agree with it. Sometimes movie talk just can't get to the little guys yeah. or, or can't get to this kind of stuff. Right. I hope that we can continue to be that platform. And look, I mean, with Eggers, like in his debut with The Witch, I mean, I, you know, I've said this on the show many times, but the first time I saw that film, I, I kind of was like this, even if I didn't love it the first time I saw it with The Witch, it is undeniable that this man is an incredible talent. He, he, the performances in this film, the way the movie looked, the sound, all of it, it is so solid and impressive. And, and I've gone on to say that, I mean, the second time I watched The Witch, I was blown away by it. I love the film. But yeah, you know, it, we got to keep our eyes on these people. And, uh, and, and, you know, I want to keep my eye on Roxanne Benjamin, who's produced uh, the VHS movies and directed a segment in Southbound and directed a segment in XX. Like we need to keep our eyes on her next or on her first feature. And, and, and the list goes on and on and on. So, uh, yeah, I hope, I hope we're around to, to sort of talk about that for sure. Because like we've said many times in this conversation, genre is big business and, uh, it's crossing over for sure. So I, I think that's really cool. Random question. Since the YouTube movie space is rather incestuous, who are your closest friends that you've made in this business? Oh, that's a great question. I love that question. You know, I think of Christian Harloff as like a big brother in a way, and he's so supportive and he's been my one of my biggest champions. So, um and I, you know, we keep in touch when we're not working, obviously. So, he's uh, I, I really love him and um, Josh McCuga and I are good friends and uh, Miri, I love Miri Jedekin and um, gosh, I know that there's a zillion more. Everybody is lovely. Mark Riley, my, my partner, I love him. Um, and uh, yeah, there, it's a really sweet community. Honestly, I, I, I don't think I've ever personally encountered somebody in that world or in that community who wasn't a complete you know, doll, to be completely honest. There's like nobody that I can think of that I don't that that I don't like. So yeah, everybody, there's a lot of really cool, sweet people out there. Except for Six Degrees and JTE. 
<laughs> would you like to take this opportunity to fire off some smack talk at your upcoming opponents? You know that I don't do that. All right. You know that I don't do that. I had to try. But uh, no, I mean, look, I got to tell you, I'm nervous. Um, it's not just some line that I keep regurgitating. I am nervous to play JTE. Listen, because I, I haven't gotten a chance to say this to anybody like publicly. I sincerely did not believe that anyone would ever beat William Bibiani. I mean this. I know William, and and he is he's an encyclopedia yeah. of nonsense. <laughs> And so I, when he played the first round, the first match, and I, I told Christian, I was like, it's over. Like, no one will be able to beat him. I sincerely meant that without hyperbole. And so to see that JTE beat him, I was just like, holy shit, that's amazing. <laughs> so, uh, so I am endlessly impressed. And by the way, I meant what I said during all of that decision nonsense. JTE knows his stuff. And, um, and he and I, uh, you know, if you combine our forces, would probably even each other out a little bit. So, um, you know, I, I think that if I miss a question and he's able to steal, he might be able to do it. So, look, I, I'm not being like humble or cute when I say I'm freaking nervous. He might he might kick my ass and I might be done in the singles for a while. So who knows? Well, Clark, as we wind down, I just want to say that I've been watching this YouTube pocket for quite a while now. I'd say five, six years, really since the start of the AMC days. So I remember you quite well from those early days. And while you left for a bit, you came back as a more confident host, in my opinion. Am I on to something here? Do you think you evolved as a host during that time away before you returned? Yeah, I think I think you are onto something. And I think too, I think I might have mentioned this somewhere else before, but experience and practice, honestly. Repetition. I mean, yeah, it's 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 kind of like my my first thing where I broke into that world was on AMC Movie Talk. I mean, that was the thing that introduced me to so many people uh, in in this digital, you know, pop culture nerd world. And um, in the time when I was on there, that was like my first go. I mean, certainly I had I had been doing interviews and carpets and vlogs and things like that before, but that was my first go at this. And I'm, I'm pleased with the way, you know, most of it went. And, um, yeah. And so in the time in between, I was doing the blood cast with Ryan Turek, who is now the head of development at Blumhouse. And I was working for Nerdist and, and I still do work for Nerdist and I was learning from them and I was getting to sort of be in a place where I felt like I was in my element. You know, I, I knew that I was going to do a good job because I was actually a nerd for all of these things that we were talking about. And, and it was that kind of experience. And it was, and, and, and so, yeah, the confidence I think just comes from doing it. And also I will say in that time, I learned that I believe that I know what I'm talking about. And I, and I learned that that is not going to be for everybody and I, and I learned how to go, okay, that is okay. I like what I do and I like what I bring to the table and I'm proud of all of that. And so I think that that is a big, that's a big part of the, of maybe the confidence boost that you see. You're absolutely right. I mean, I'm, when I think back to the summer or the spring of 2013 right. and now, oh my gosh, it was only a couple of short years, but geez, it's just so much is different. So uh, yeah, I think you're catching on to experience for sure. Last question. What advice would you offer to women who are looking to get into the YouTube movie space? Well, it's the same advice that honestly I would give to anyone who is looking to get into that space. And it is know who you are and know what you bring to the table. Don't worry about trying to be funny or trying to be the smartest or trying to be this. Just be you. If you have something that you love, if you love Tarantino movies, be the Tarantino guy. Just know who you are and, and focus on that and embrace that because that passion for the thing that you truly love is going to be the thing that sets you apart. Am I wrong? Can you tell when someone is fake excited about something? Absolutely. I mean, and that's the thing is that it's amazing how there's so much 
bullshit on the internet and there's so much so much misinformation on the internet but there's such a true space for authenticity on the internet that I think is so interesting. Specifically, if there are women listening to this, it's going to be harder for you. I, I'm not going to say that it isn't, but the question is, do you care about the nonsense or are you proud of what you brought to the table? Because I have found that every time I am proud of what I brought to the table, if I catch flack for it, I don't care. <laughs> and so, and so I think having that confidence and having that, um, that passion is, is really and truly the thing that is going to set you apart. Would you tell people to steer clear of the comments in their, I'd say their first year on the job? I wouldn't. Uh, now I do think that there is, uh, there is something to be said for okay, don't read everything. I mean, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to like punish yourself with all of the horrible things that are, that are, that could be said. But, but I do think that you sort of, in my experience, at least I had to see it and process it and understand it. And that way I don't get rattled by it. If you see it again or, it, or, and that's, and then you, and you appreciate people who say, Hey, don't be a jerk or whatever. Or you appreciate people who say, I like you. I like what you do. Keep doing what you're doing. I mean, I think taking all of it in to some extent is, is actually valid. However, there are times where you have to, you know, know when it's time to say, okay, we're done here. This is, this is not, this is not useful or helpful anymore. I've said before, and I'll say it again, I read every comment that comes in uh, on nightmares because I'm the showrunner. So when I see people saying nasty things about me, maybe I should say it like this, read the comments as a producer. Don't read the comments as you. And when I look at the nightmares comments, I go, okay, this person wants to hear more about this. Great. This segment worked. This guest didn't work. Um, they liked this. They liked that. If it's Clark's stupid, I hate her face and her dumb voice. It's like, okay, I don't have time for that. And so if you can get into the mindset of how can I make my show better? How can I make my performance better? How can I make my scripts better? And actually learn how to separate the people who are just being mean to the people who actually are valid, uh, have valid concerns. I think that's actually very valuable. I just hope that we can get to a place where the majority of comments towards women are related to the work they've done or the thoughts they've expressed and not just their appearance for that day. Totally. I couldn't say it better myself. I mean, I will say it's frustrating to me if I don't wear my glasses one day that a show that I worked all week on putting together and booking and writing and researching and presenting and making a show. And the, the number one thing people are talking about is Clark looks weird without her glasses or whatever. It's like, guys, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> Stop talking about this. And it, it's frustrating because that's my show. Nightmares is my baby. That's my thing. I make it every week. So yeah, I don't care what you think about my glasses. <laughs> like, but I will say, thank you for making that point. And leading by example is the way to do it. So if you happen to be in the comment board and, uh, and you see this stuff going on, you see the really nasty, bad things that people are saying, um, about anyone or any particular thing, you know, it, it really helps if you do chime in and say, not cool, bullies are bullies because nobody stands up to them. And um, one day people will be evaluated on their thoughts, but that day will come when you can't be an anonymous uh, user, I think, because then people might get a little more, a little more honest, but we'll see. Also, for those listening, there comes a point where a panel is firing on all cylinders and it's worth tuning in regardless of the subject matter. So with TV Talk's panel in a state of flux, I can say that Nightmares is my favorite Collider panel right now. You're going to have a good time with Riley, Schnepp, Perry, and our present company. Well, that's kind, and thank you for saying that. And I think at the end of the day, what you're seeing on our panel are four people who have very different views on, on the same topic, but all at the end of the day, love that topic. And I think that is the recipe for success because if we all fell in line with one another, it'd be boring. But yeah, I really appreciate that. And I'm, I'm really, really proud that when it comes to our pundits, we always, 
with maybe one exception, have two women and two men. That's very, very important to me. And honestly, I am, I, I hope that if Nightmares continues to incorporate people, uh, more people of color, because at the end of the day, we are four white people uh, talking about things, which is fine. But yeah, I think I think including more different voices in the conversation is uh, is really important. But at the end of the day, if you all love the things you're talking about, then that's that's going to be the magic. Clark, now is your time to plug away. <laughs> Please let the good people know how they can keep nightmares on the air besides liking and commenting. First of all, thank you again for the platform and for the opportunity to talk. This was super fun and I had a lovely time. And um, yeah, you know, look, we need to get those numbers up. So what I would say is if you listen to nightmares as a, as, as a podcast, maybe you try downloading the YouTube app on your phone and, uh, you know, listening to it through the, through the actual video, even if you don't watch it, please spread the word. Um, you know, again, share that video, share that link to that video so that people, if they're curious, they can just click play, whether it's on Facebook or whether it's on Instagram or whether it's on YouTube. Uh, and, uh, and it's right there. And those views are there. And finally, what you can do to support nightmares is give us a try. Give us a try. If maybe you didn't think that it would be a show for you initially, but you're curious or you like the people who are on the panel or you just like Collider programming and you want to try something new, maybe give us a whirl for the next couple of weeks or watch some previous episodes. But going forward, I would say, is the most important thing. So if you can watch in the coming weeks, that's going to be the key. Let the people know, you know, let let the higher ups know, tag them, tag them on social media and tell them that you love the show. I think that that would go a long way. If every listener tells one friend, I think we're in business. I love it. I love it. Clark, I want to thank you for joining me on the Schmoville After Show. Since we put this together last minute, I asked Schmoville's Facebook group if they had any questions. And someone said, I don't have any questions. Just let her know how great she is. So, Aww. Clark, I'm letting you know how great you are, and we hope that you remain on the channel for many years to come. Well, I thank you very much. Thank you again for making the time to talk to me and to help to help us. And, and what a treat it was. What a lovely conversation. I, I hope that we can talk again sometime. And, uh, yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you, Schmoville. Sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, nightmares or no, you guys have been very welcoming to me, and I am very grateful. Uh, it means a lot to me, so thank you. Well, there you have it, folks. Big thanks to Clark Wolf for coming on the show. Now, let's go out and save nightmares for her. Again, tell a friend or two, share every upcoming episode via social media, and most importantly, watch the show in YouTube. I know a lot of you like to listen to the audio feed, but if you want to keep listening to it, you've got to watch the show on YouTube for the next few weeks. I also want to give a shout out to a few Schmoville Facebookians for inspiring some of the interview's questions, including Ryan McKenna, Efren Guzman, Frank Montoya, Michael Kay, Jason Heron, and Justin Ayotte. Apologies if I overlooked anyone. And as far as this show, rate and review the Schmoes Know podcast feed in iTunes, as well as through the podcast app on your various Apple devices. Make sure to tune in every Sunday for the real Schmoville after show where I break down the week that was in Collider and Schmoes Know programming. Aaron Turner will make his debut this week as co-host. Until then, you can find me, Brian Davids, at BDF331, as well as at filmschlubspodcast.com. Oh, and don't forget to tweet the hashtag Save Nightmares to Christian and Campia. Let them know how you feel about the show and continue to let them know how you feel over the next few weeks. In other words, become their worst nightmare. All right, I'll see you guys on Sunday.